academic uh, season of Russian public policy events. Uh, my name is Alex Cooley. I'm the current director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. And on behalf of my partner, Josh Tucker, who's the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at NYU, we'd like to uh, welcome you to this first session with a very timely topic, the results of Russia's 2021 parliamentary elections. How should we understand them? Just a couple of uh, brief overviews. Uh, this is a series now entering, I believe, our fifth year of existence, um, which seeks to bring cross-disciplinary and cross-professional expertise to bear on pressing topics in the public domain that concern Russia. And I don't think anything can become as pressing as uh, the, the latest results of national legislative uh, elections. Um, we'd also like to thank our sponsors, Carnegie Corporation of New York for supporting this continued work. We certainly appreciate um, your support. Um, as always, the idea is to bring academics into dialogue with observers um, about the latest trends. And so uh, the format today, as always, will be to have a panel discussion and then a Q&A. Um, without further ado, let me hand it over to my partner, Josh, who will do uh, the individual um, uh, introductions. But uh, just again, welcome everyone. And thanks again for sharing your lunch hour, or dinner hour, depending on where you are with us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, it's great to be here. It's great to be back. It's amazing that this is our fifth year doing this. Um, and I'm really excited to have the guests who we have here with us. And just to give a quick overview of the way the process works. We have five um, great speakers today who are going to talk for approximately 10 minutes each. We will then, um, Alex and I will then pose a couple questions to them, at which point we'll then open it up to the audience for discussion. You, The way that since we're in the webinar format, the way that you will ask a question is with the Q&A button as opposed to with the chat button. So use the Q&A button. The nice thing about this, we'll then select questions from there to read to the panelists. The nice thing about this, however, though, is that you can ask your questions at any time. So as speakers are speaking, if you want to jot down questions that you have for them in the Q&A, that's fantastic. Um, and as Alex said, we have a great combination here today, as we always try to do, of bringing uh, policymakers, and in this case, uh, uh, academics and, jour and journalists together today. Um, and so we're, well, we're really delighted to have two reporters from the Moscow Times who have been covering the election as well as three additional academics. I'll introduce, in the interest of time, I'll introduce everyone before they speak and we'll go around and have the speakers uh, in, talk in turn. So our first speaker today is Jake Cordell, who's a reporter covering the Russian economy and business world for the Moscow Times. Originally from the UK, Jake previously worked in London as an economics correspondent and in Prague for an organization supporting independent media and civil society across the former Soviet Union. Jake? Hello there. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak this evening, this afternoon, this morning, wherever you are. Um, yeah, so I would like to talk a little bit, set the scene here in Moscow and talk really about the pre-election period, some of the broad context, the mood here in Russia, both before and that will help us understand the mood after the vote as we move towards uh, 2024 and all the themes that are going to be playing out in Russian politics over the next few years. So in terms of the mood here on the ground before the vote, I think it's fair to say across much of the country, both in Moscow and in the regions, it was probably one of, of apathy. There, there really wasn't much enthusiasm out there for this election, either positive enthusiasm from pro-Kremlin voices or really much enthusiasm amongst opposition voices, um, which have really obviously been squashed over the last year. And that's obviously partly a success of the Kremlin cleaning the field, perhaps more so than they've done in any other vote. They've really specialized this approach to sanitizing who can stand in elections, you know, by naming Navalny's organization extremist months ago, by handing out administrative fines over the past years. They block candidates from running and they've really avoided the kind of situation they saw a few years ago in Moscow when they had to claim that tens of thousands of signatures were fake and it spun the capital into protest. So the Kremlin have really honed this approach of, of killing off that kind of enthusiasm before the vote. But I want to look a bit, that, that's the tactical side, I want to look a little bit <clears throat> as to why the Kremlin felt that it needed to do that. And that comes in the, in the broader socio-political uh, economic context. 
a lot of what I'm going to say probably won't be revolutionary new. You're probably very well aware of it, but I think it's good to recap kind of where we stood as we went into the into the election and in the context of the campaign. So support for United Russia, and I'm talking about genuine support, not the electoral support that we saw in the actual vote, um, has really cratered in recent years. Before the election, they were polling 27, 28, 29 percent, the worst level they've they've recorded since they were very founded. That incidentally seems to be in line with what some statisticians say they probably got among the real voters, but I think there'll be more of that later. And the reason for this is, is largely economic. L living standards have fallen dramatically. In real terms, disposable incomes are down 10% since they were in, in 2013. And Russians really feel like they're not living in the Russia they were promised in 2000, 2004, even 2014 after Crimea. And this year, as we turned into the campaign, this really came back into focus. The Russian economy got through the coronavirus pandemic better than most in the world, but inflation came back and inflation has really hit the Russian economy quite hard. Uh, there are lots of scary statistics out there about how inflation is hitting living standards. Three quarters of all Russians say they can't buy basic necessities. Levada poll has consumer confidence at its lowest level in, in years and, and typically showing that poorest Russians are, are the least optimistic, much more so than they were before the pandemic. Um, for me here in Russia, I think it really hit home this idea of inflation when you're looking at these statistics is <clears throat> when I went to uh, Saransk, which is a, a small city, six or seven hours outside of Moscow uh, for a reporting trip. And I was talking to entrepreneurs. How are you feeling ahead of the election? You know, entrepreneurs and small business owners, they should typically be a source of opposition to the regime because they're the ones who see corruption. They see Russia's oppressive bureaucracy on, on really a daily basis almost. So I was talking to some of them. I talked to one guy who, who owns some bakeries in the city. And he was really saying that, um, we were talking about the, the business climate. He did fine during the pandemic. He even opened some new chains during the pandemic. But what he was really worried about was inflation. And he said that his prices were going up like 10% for the stuff, you know, flour and stuff for his, his bakery. And, um, and, and he, he didn't know whether he could pass any of these costs on to his customers. And I had a look around, a look at the prices. And, you know, he's selling a loaf of bread for like 50 rubles. So what's that? 70 cents, something. He's selling little cakes for like 30 rubles. So this is not like a luxury, you know, French style bakery. This is really like your everyday bakery. And he didn't know whether if he raised the price of his bread from 50 cents to 52 cents, whether his customers would run away. And I think this is, was a really stark example of the kind of red line, quite literally Russia, that, that lots of people uh, feel like they're living in. And I think this is the economic factors which underline the lack of support for United Russia. And I think I wanna mention one, one thing that, that is worth mentioning, which I don't think or I didn't hear on the campaign trail is a factor in United Russia's falling support. And that is the handling of the coronavirus pandemic from a health side of view. And I think it's important to, to highlight that here in Russia, you look at the statistics, if you're outside Russia and you see, you know, 600,000 excess deaths, at the moment, Russia sees more fatalities than any, anywhere else in the world. But really here on the ground, there isn't a great sense of anger or disappointment at the way the government has handled the health aspects of the coronavirus pandemic. And, and there are lots of reasons for that, and maybe we can get into them in the Q&A, but I just wanted to mention that that's why I feel like the economic factors are a much more driving force of United Russia's lack of support. So given this background, there is clearly a desire for some kind of change in Russia. You know, two thirds of Russians say they would rather live in a country with higher living standards than live in a country where it's the feared and dominated all over the world. And that's the highest level that's been in about 20 years. So this change, this desire for change does exist. But I think what we've seen in this campaign is it's not really translating into any sense of political or electoral enthusiasm, at least. This is the prevo apathy I'm talking about on both sides. Now, yes, there was an upswing in support for the Communist Party and some other parties. And I think Felix is going to talk about this later. But I think 
the, the, the reasons people say when you ask them why they're not enthusiastic, even as opponents of the regime, is they understand the system that Russia has. They, they, they say, my vote won't make a difference. The results, we know the results. There's no candidates I like. And this feeling of inevitable result creates this cycle whereby there's apathy among opposition, maybe not hardcore opposition, but you know the floating opposition who are disappointed because they know it won't make a difference. So what's the point in taking part? What's the point in getting enthusiastic? And then that creates a system, a situation where the result they knew was going to happen, happens anyway. And the Kremlin was able to really capitalize on this. So the Kremlin, as it always, has run this kind of dual campaign. You know, it sees elections as some kind of necessary evil. You know, it doesn't want to have some kind of 99% uh, support on 99% turnout. It, it, does, it does still believe it drives some legitimacy from electoral politics. But what they did was they didn't want to increase turnout across the board in this election, of course, because of discontent was so high. So ahead of the election, we saw these targeted measures trying to boost support amongst their key supporters and key followers. And of course, this manifested itself in the huge cash handouts we saw go to pensioners. <clears throat> pensioners got an extra month of, of, of their pension, basically about three weeks before the election. And uh, so did military service personnel. This cost the Russian government something like $7 billion. Uh, and it's probably going to lead to more inflation, which is the problem they're, they're, they're trying to focus on. But at the same time, here in Moscow, there was definitely a feeling that this was a very muted election campaign, that the Kremlin was playing in to this apathy, which in part they created. There was no real great push no real exciting debates or intrigue on, on state TV or something. This really was about managing expectations, about managing the electoral performance, delivering what they could deliver and minimizing support amongst, minimizing turnout and enthusiasm for the election among the opposition or among the dis, dis, disconcerted parts of society. And I think as we move into the discussion about the results, we can really see that that factor worked in terms of they got the result they were wanting for perhaps even easier than they thought they were and um and i think they will see it as a success in terms of how they managed the campaign and played into this apathy so i think i will leave it there for my opening remarks and plenty to come back to with the other speakers and also in the q a so thank you very much wonderful thanks so much jake thanks for for the insightful remarks also thanks for the background and just sort of kicking off you know giving us a little bit of 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 a start for the discussion um we're going to turn to uh, jake's colleague at the at at the moscow times felix light who's a reporter covering politics culture and society in russia and the former soviet union for the moscow times uh outside work he enjoys history and languages and yoga so felix take it away yeah true words never spoken thank you thank you very much thank you um so yeah, uh, my, Jake, having spoken sort of about, I guess, the process of the campaign and the broad background, I guess uh, I'll, I'll focus a little bit more on the results and the extent to which they sort of make sense. Uh, and, and in some cases, of course, don't make sense. Um, so I think, you know, once, our, uh, once everything had been sort of largely decided in this election, you know, obviously it's a Russian election, it's not competitive in the truest sense, but there's a certain degree of sort of uh, uh, uncertainty over given results. And once those results had been published, I sort of asked myself to what extent I was surprised by them. And I think the answer uh, is that I wasn't especially surprised at all. I think that the, the campaign was, was conditioned by a couple of sort of uh, countervailing and sort of very much mutually contradictory factors that I think define, largely defined much of the course of it. And the first was that uh, United Russia was clearly in trouble. Um, Jake has already spoken about this uh, at some length, but you know, they're, they're polling uh, not just in the course of the campaign, but actually for some years had become, uh, had really become mired around a sort of a historically dismal sort of, you know, at first it was 35%, then it was 30%, then it was sort of the high 20s. And we went into election day with it sort of there. Um, and that's a result of many things. It's a result of sort of economic pressures. Uh, it's a result of the pension reform in 2018, which, you know, halved the party's ratings overnight. Um, but the, the fact that sort of, well, went some way at least to cancelling that out was the fact that it was clear, I think, from the behavior of the Kremlin that no result other than another large United Russia victory uh, would be deemed acceptable and would be allowed to happen. You know, we, I, I can't think of anything sort of in the behavior of the Russian government over the last sort of year to 18 months 
that would suggest that they were likely to sort of concede uh, meaningful positions within the Duma to you know, representatives, even sort of crypto representatives of like of the so-called non-systemic opposition, people backed by Navalny, people backed by smart voting. Uh, you know, you could look at the, the, the poisoning of Navalny last summer, you could, or the summer before last, rather. You could look at the sort of tightening uh, control over the electoral process in general. You could look at things like overturning election results that don't go United Russia's way. Most famously, of course, with Sergei Furgal in Khabarovsk, you know, this is uh, there is very little willingness anymore i think to tolerate the electoral process going the wrong way even as it remains very crucial in terms of uh, ginning up legitimacy um and i think the sort of mixed result that we sort of came out with which is essentially um united russia running i think very improbably the table uh, in moscow uh, the sort of the opposition heart of moscow uh, winning every seat it contested and the rest of the seats, I think, all being won by sort of explicit allies, more or less, of United Russia, even as the party of power loses ground in much more sort of traditionally and historically friendly parts of Russia, Siberia, the Far East, the Urals, in all of these places. And indeed, in many of the sort of the, the, the rock solid, I suppose, United Russia heartlands, rural Russia and the European part of Russia, uh, we see either the communists outright winning or the United Russia margin sinking right, right down in some cases into the sort of the high 30s. So, you know, uh, very much a, a sort of a, the party of power still, but the party of power in a plurality. So really, really suffering here, I think. And, and that's, you know, that is sort of what we, what, we, what we sort of saw in the results. And I think that was largely a reflection of these two trends. Um, I think the third thing that is really important that Jake's already spoken of quite a lot is apathy. You know, it, it cannot be uh overestimated the extent to which this election was informed by a, a great deal of sort of popular disinterest you know and that was that was both sort of like organic i think from the part of the electors but also it was it was induced you know we had thing we had sort of very absurd spectacles like uh, election debates airing at 7 30 in the morning you know there was there was there was quite i think a deliberate effort to sort of um to, towards sort of asymmetric mobilization you know the state believing that it could drive its sort of um its dependent constituency, state workers, perhaps pensioners as well to the polls, while basically inducing sort of uh, a lack of interest in anyone else, in anyone viewed as unlikely to support United Russia. And I think we basically got that, you know, uh, early on in the campaign, I went to Varonezh, and I, I, it's a city in the south of Russia. It's basically done very, very well, actually, under the Putin uh, in the Putin era, um, it's 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 one of uh, the it usually sort of tops rankings of cities of good cities to live in in Russia. You know, it's it's economically thriving. Uh, it's sort of uh, quite sort of uh, aesthetically pleasing. It's just it's it's generally considered a nice place to live. And I sort of went there thinking it would be some kind of like United Russia heartland. And in the end, I found it exceptionally hard to find anyone who would sort of say they were voting for United Russia or indeed that they were voting at all. And that was really borne out in the eventual turnout results. So um, the official turnout results for Voronezh city is that about 30% of people cast ballots, which is you know, extraordinary given the extent to which we know that um, state sector workers are you know, uh, compelled to one, one extent or other into, for, into sort of voting. Uh, and sort of, you know, there's all kinds of ways that the, 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 the turnout is sort of artificially increased. But, it, but you know, in a, in a fairly sort of pro-government heartland, it was really down to that core constituency of 30 percent, which is sort of what we see in the polls. It's also the number of Russians we see uh, saying that they trust Putin in polls. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's right down to the sort of the core, the core vote share, though. Um, I think to sort of segue onwards, it would be be a little bit remiss not to mention smart voting because, of course, it it, it attracted a lot of attention, uh, and uh, it, you know it, it's 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 a hugely important thing in terms of this this uh, the what you know, determining what's left or what isn't left of the Navalny movement. Um, I think you know there's been a sort of uh, a slightly kind of um, uh, fashionable and I think I think important skepticism of what it can do. I think there's very little evidence that uh, it, it meaningfully contributed to the success of, say, communist candidates in Siberia in those handful of cases where they sort of unseated United Russia uh, deputies. But what I was really astonished by uh, is that is its success in Moscow. And I think that's very important because the, the, the basic sort of task put before uh, the sort of the, 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 the Kremlin this, this time was to essentially prevent a rerun of 2019 when there was a massive amount of political uh, mobilization because of these sort of 
uh, largely pretty flagrant disallowances of candidates from running, uh, followed by United Russia actually doing then very badly in the Moscow elections. Uh, this time that was avoided, of course, by this sort of by uh, the sort of 11th hour addition of uh, enormous amounts of unauditable and unverifiable online votes. But what I think was extraordinary in Moscow is that uh, we saw uh, very, very, very high levels of column solidation around candidates backed by Navalny. Uh, you know, so Jake and I wrote a couple of sto a story about a couple of opposition candidates or candidates in uh, Moscow districts where there was sort of, there, there was a very, very strong chance that, uh, you know, the opposition vote would be very, very split and United Russia would be able to come through the middle and win. Um, in the end, it really, really didn't come out like that because even though United Russia, of course, did win, uh, the opposition candidacies chosen by Navalny, chosen by smart voting, uh, demonstrated extraordinary capacity to basically attract almost every available opposition leaning vote in the constituency. So I think there is clearly like an extraordinary ability uh, in, in Moscow, at least, of smart voting to really attract very, very large numbers of, of votes and really, really determined behavior, even if in this instance it didn't uh, amount to much. Um, I, I am a conscious of time going on, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, I'll, I'll, I'll cut to my sort of electoral chase. And I wanted to sort of discuss a couple of things that, that I think, you know, the, 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 the concrete results of this election, which I think was the success of two concrete parties. Um, firstly, the communists, and secondly, new people. Uh, new People, if you're sort of not aware, is this sort of um, uh, very bland, uh, very kind of, uh, well, I mean, vapid, one might say, sort of vaguely liberal party, but is very much sort of from the, from, from, from the world of sort of pro-Putin, uh, you know, choreographed uh, politics. It's very much a project of, um, of, of the presidential administration, of those Kremlin uh, uh, officers who sort of very much coordinate domestic politics. Uh, I don't think I was surprised by the success of either of them. I think it's very easy to explain to yourself why they sort of, why they succeeded. I think in particular, uh, the communists doing well is not uh, unsurprising. I think clearly uh, the sort of the issue profile of this election, the, the questions that sort of were educating Russians voter preferences in this election, as, as Jake already sort of showed, were very favorable to the communists. You know, the communists even now have a very, very strong, almost a monopoly on sort of issues of social justice or issues of social welfare. And I think things like inflation, things like prices, things like the eroding welfare state played very, very strongly into their hands. Uh, we also have a sort of, I think the, the idea that the, the, the communists are simply a much more independent opposition party than any of the others uh, on offer. Uh, you know, they're, they're simply very much more real than the LDPR or Just Russia or any of the others. And I think people vote for them almost out of in a transactional way. They want to sort of rock the boat. They want to vote for someone who is uh, able to stand up for United to United Russia, able to, you know, and willing to stand up to United Russia more so. Um, I would also note that I think the only one of the only concrete ways in which coronavirus, I suspect, affected this election is playing into the communist hands because the communists ran very heavily on sort of anti-vaccine, uh, anti sort of coronavirus restriction issues. And I think that was um, a very underrated element of their success. There's this extraordinary um, uh, correlation, it seems, between the more radical and pro-Navalny a communist is, this is my anecdotal observation, the more likely they are to be a convinced anti-vaxxer as well, which is, uh, you know, make of that what you will, but I think it's a fascinating uh, uh, situation. Uh, I will just wrap up now with a brief sort of dissection of the new people thing. Um, you know, new people was, it, it was almost a surprise of the election. Uh, you know, it, it, it was it was treated certainly in sort of the Moscow liberal opposition community as a sort of, uh, you know, a fairly flagrant Kremlin-backed spoiler, you know, to leech sort of liberal votes away from places uh, where they could be more damaging to United Russia. Uh, but I wasn't totally surprised to see them coming into the, the, the Duma. Um, you know, in, in a number of trips entirely unrelated to the elections, I was, ex I was outside Moscow in particular, I was astonished uh, to how, how big New People's presence was there. They're, you know, they're, they're founded by a guy, uh, a guy who runs a sort of um, a, a, a multi-level marketing cosmetics company. So they have a sort of a pre-existing presence throughout much of Russia. But I mean, to give you an anecdotal impression of this, I was I, in April, I was in a Dagestani mountain village and uh, their, their, um, their billboards were all over the place. And the kids in the guest house I was staying were watching their sort of like uh, infomercials on TV. So, you know, there was an extraordinary sort of cut through there. And I think it is a, it's a substantial sort of constituency that kind of, um, you know, broadly, the sit broadly pro system, broadly, perhaps pro Putin, but also uh, pro, I suppose, uh, liberalism, pro rule of law and, and, and born of a sort of a concern 
concerned that things have gone too far. I think it's in terms of, you know, repressions, in terms of uh, the power of the so-called Siloviki, I think it's a very sort of uh, a potent political product and has a very, very large constituency in Russia. Now, most of these people probably don't vote, but I think in principle, it's a very, very, very uh, large political market to be in. And I'm not at all surprised that they got into the Duma. And I wouldn't be surprised if they were a sort of a permanent political presence. Uh, that being said, they have there is a, reportedly a great deal of suspicion of them from the part, on the part of the security services, on the part of the other parties. Uh, but I think certainly their presence in the Duma is very interesting. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm personally very, very interested to see what they make of their presence in the, in the authorities. Uh, I, will, I will hand on to the next speaker now, conscious that I've nearly gone over my time. So um, please, thank you. Great. Thanks, Felix. Now, and you just made it in under the under the mark there. So that's fine. Um, <clears throat> so it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome back David Ciccone, who's an assistant professor of political science at George Washington University and co-founder of the Anti-Corruption Data Collective. His academic research focuses on corruption, clientelism and political economy in Russia, Western Europe and the United States. Uh, he has led numerous investigations into political corruption and opacity in the private equity and real estate industries, which have been published in the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, The Daily Beast, and the Miami Herald, among other outlets. In addition, he's a research fellow at the International Center for the Study of Institutions and Development at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. David? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's always great to chat with people that are on the ground. Um, and they also covered so much of the ground that I was going to talk about, which is fantastic because we can go a little more into theory. Where's my mask go? So to 2021 Duma elections, this is really my gloves coming off impression. Um, and I'm going to kind of contextualize a lot of what Jake and Felix said and, and put this in a, in a broader context and try not to bore you with all the background um, details, which they've already done a great job of introducing. So. United Russia is historically unpopular all summer, and it's just an incredible uphill battle as we're going into September to translate a less than 30% popularity rate into the constitutional majority in the Duma that they so need in order to, to keep hold on power and pass any laws going forward to further strengthen that. So the big question here is how do you win an election without suffering blowback? How do you turn less than 30% into a constitutional majority without angering every single person in Russia to the point where they you, you lose or you undermine your hold on power. And the real challenge, and I think this goes underappreciated, and I have some work that came out this year with John Reuter about this, is that Russians generally want free and fair elections. This is not a country that tolerates necessarily blatant electoral fraud, and that many people believe, and now it's hard to... It, to, to kind of pinpoint this, but there are a lot of people in Russia that believe that elections, even the ones that happened last week, are free and fair because of information control, because of propaganda, because of just perceptions of the regime. They don't have the same access to the information that perhaps the opposition does or perhaps the Western community does about how much fraud is actually going on. So they generally believe that United Russia and the Putin government are, are winning free and fair elections, and they also expect that elections going forward should be held to a high standard. And there's various explanations for that. Some of that is their experience of elections in the 1990s. Some of that is aspirations to joining the West and get bringing Russia closer. And some of it just from a normative standpoint is that democracy is the best, if not the worst way to, to elect your, your leaders. So the challenge for the regime is that they need to respect that demand for free and fair elections, but they also need to win. And in order to win, they need to, to play in the margins and manipulate votes and participate in all the funny business that has really captivated headlines. So the game plan that they rolled out, which I, I, I don't want to praise the Putin government, that's the last thing I want to be on record doing, but this is really innovative stuff that they rolled out over the last couple of months that really demonstrates lessons learned over the past couple of Duma campaigns and putting into new strategies and, and a, something that worked for them. And we're a week out. We haven't seen a lot of post-election protests and Regina will talk about why, but it's possible that they're in the clear for, the, for a while. And I'll, I'll kind of close these remarks with some kind of counterintuitive expectations of what the, the implementation of this new strategy frees them to do. Because this is the least constrained Putin government that we've seen in a long time. And I think the rollout of the electoral strategy is their test run of this. And it's it's been, I hate to use the word impressive, but they've they've definitely learned from what went wrong over the last 10 years. So what do they do? First, 
this idea that Felix talked about asymmetrical mobilization, I think that's a fantastic way of terming this, where you, you want to mobilize your base. And the way they did it is that they, they spent 500 billion rubles in targeted transfers for pensioners, military, and law enforcement. And they also indexed salary to above inflation for law enforcement. Now, yes, they've done this before. It was 5,000 rubles in 2016, but now it's 10,000 in 20, 2021. So that's a doubling of the payments for, for many of these groups. But then they supplemented in Moscow with these lotteries and prizes. I don't know if you saw that Peskov and Venediktov won the lottery for um, 10,000 rubles, I think they got, for registering to vote online. And of course, they gave away to charity. But the idea that the head of the smart or the, the electronic voting won the random lottery for a prize is as farcical as you can imagine. But that's that's new. That's It's got fancy marketing. Um, and the idea of receiving an apartment or a car for registering to vote is again, demonstrated that, that there's new ideas that are coming in, even if they're only effective on the margin. But with the carrot, you get the six. And that's this voter intimidation that, you know, with the Tim Fry and John Roy that we've been studying for over a decade now, I don't think we expected necessarily the intimidation to go down, but it was just a full frontal use of so many different vulnerable populations. And I should say, you know, in Russia, vote buying historically has not been that common. There's been bread or sugar or potatoes given out and kind of one-off things, but this kind of like mass payments hasn't really been a characteristic of past Russian elections, partly because the electorate was, was wealthier. And now these pensions might, or these payments might actually work to convince them to vote. But the intimidation has really scaled up. And I think what's interesting about it, as you can see from this screenshot, is that it's being, it's acquiring more technologically savvy aspects to it, such as WhatsApp groups where you need to demonstrate that you voted and more pictures of ballots being distributed and then evidence of electronic voting being transmitted to your employer to make sure that they can confirm that you followed their, their rules, you followed their orders to vote accordingly. This is my favorite one. Um, this is an email sent out the week before the election um, from the, the design firm. So this is architects. These aren't factory line workers. These are architects designing some of Moscow's coolest metro stations getting an email from their, their boss that's really telling us how many people are voting in your department, how many are voting distantly, um, how many are voting with absentee ballots, and then tell us everything about this. So these are more kind of creative class type workers that have pulled off some really creative feats um, that are getting directives from their bosses. And again, this is a publicly traded company with strong ties to the regime. So this idea of voter workplace mobilization, again, I didn't expect it to go away, but I, I wouldn't necessarily have expected it to be such a important part of the campaign strategy this time around. So if you mobilize your base, then you also want to demobilize your opposition. And we can talk about this ad nauseum, but really it's about removing choice. The regime, and I've got an experiment that I will get results on Thursday, is I think the regime is more popular when there is an alternative obviously, right? If there's no other choice, the regime looks better. You take the, the alternative off the ballot, then even if you're unhappy with the status quo, there's some bias towards incumbency that they can take advantage of. So over 9 million people in Russia cannot run for office. They've been disqualified for various reasons. Candidates have been filtered. There are spoiler candidates, as we saw really with um, St. Petersburg and manufactured parties. You're removing and you're shaping choice so that the regime looks better compared to a set of worse alternatives. And then for challengers, it's really, at this point, exiled prisoner apathy, um, that there's not let much of a choice anymore. And I'll talk about this at the end, about how the regime has done so much, have put so many resources into preventing challengers from seeing a political career as, as, as worthwhile, as, as, a willing to, as enough to pay the bills and not put their family at risk. And I think the regime, more so than it has in the last couple of years, is welcoming people not coming back to Russia and preventing them and, and, and happy if the expats go to Tbilisi or Latvia or Prague. As long as they stay out of Russia, that's better than having them starting problems within. And then this, gosh, Google, Apple, it, knowing exactly the vulnerabilities of the tech firms and knowing that they're always going to, not always, but mostly going to put money in markets over democratic principles and that the regime could exploit that to their advantage by threatening their workers and they would cave over the smart voting app. So that's, that's a savvy recognition of how Silicon Valley works and how important the Russian internet marketplace is to know that just the right pressure point on these firms would have them cave at the critical moment to take down the apps and take down the Google Docs in advance of the election. So this, this demonstrates an understanding of, of broader issues beyond just what's it gonna to take to win a vote. 
then finally, there's this, you have to minimize the overt fraud and protect those that are responsible. So we saw training and education that went alongside the voter intimidation. So if somebody asks questions, as this pamphlet shows you, they've got these stock answers about, hey, you know, I wasn't pressured. I had the normal amount of, of campaigning before this. Everything's fine. I voted according to my own principles. Well, if you need to tell somebody that in a Word document that they voted according to their own principles, then you've got a little disconnect. But I think that's interesting that they're they're anticipating that there is going to be fallout and paying bloggers and influencers to dominate social media to try to minimize those consequences and using electronic voting where you can't hold anybody accountable. Who's going to go to jail for that? How can we even prove that these votes are fraudulent? That's so much different than 10 years ago with the ballot box videos and the, the statistical evidence. I can talk in the Q&A, but this idea that you can't copy and paste data from the central election website anymore, it, it gave the regime five or seven days before the really damaging data analysis came out. And that's a, that's a critical period for post-election protests. And it's possible that the news cycle has already moved on, especially in the West. And that's one of the more unfortunate things about everything that's going on is the international community it's just not, not raising the storm that it did in past elections. So I will wrap up and to say that, there's what I see this is going, right? There's really great work by Dan Treisman and Sergey Kuryev about informational autocrats, that you don't need to rule so repressively as long as you have control over the information. And in Russia, we see this very much so. The great Russian firewall seems to be months, if not years away, um, monopolization of the news, Navalny's in jail, but I think the third pillar that hasn't gotten enough attention is this economic subordination and that they're really in the same way that Navalny and a lot of the investigators are going after money within the regime and trying to track the money. The regime now is flipping the script a little bit and punishing dissent monetarily and professionally in the way that we saw not since the 1960s and 1970s in the Soviet Union, whereas your livelihood and your family's livelihood and your ability to self-actualize is now under threat if you challenge the regime politically. And that doesn't matter where you work. We're seeing this for low-level employees. We're seeing this at high-level employees. This third pillar of making money, your money, your welfare depend on political obedience, I think is really critical for understanding the future of the regime. I will end with this speculation, and I'm sure there's going to be pushback, but you got to use these fora to put out new ideas. And that is you know, under competitive authoritarianism in Russia, we didn't see a lot of big, bold moves. There was just a lot of political paralysis. They tried to reform pensions, but they scaled it back after there was um, pushback. There, there haven't been a lot of the massive projects or developments or experiments that you might expect from the regime. And I think part of that is because when they have tried to roll things out, the population has been able to push back and say, we don't like that. It's possible that with this hardened autocracy, that they might try bolder political moves because the strategy of containing dissent is more effective and more powerful than it has been. And it's possible that the regime could experiment and do things that it feels emboldened to do because the dissent and the dissidents and the, and the challengers and the independent journalists have been sidelined so effectively to kind of break through some of the, the political stagnation that we've seen in recent past. So just an, an idea to throw that out there for discussion about the regime has bought itself a lot of time in breathing room by the constitutional changes in this election. And it doesn't have to face the, the voters for a while. And if it does, it's got a, a tried and true strategy in order to win them over how you define that, that, that gives it a little bit more space to take some risks. <clears throat> Thank you so much, David. I, just a quick clarification. David, you said at the end that they would try bolder political moves. Did you mean economic policy or did you mean political policies? I think it's possible. I think it, like, it, both economic and policy. So maybe something in Siberia, there's been talk about like new cities and like these massive authoritarian modernization projects that you see in the Gulf and you see in other, in China, for example, where it's not worried about the political fallout and they do really huge infrastructure projects. So they try to experiment in ways that might not be politically feasible if there's a lot of democratic opposition. We're getting closer to that. So we might start to see those other elements of development strategy come to the fore. Great. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker will be Gulnaz Jarafudunova, Nova, sorry <laughs> if I mangled that again, uh, who is a professor of political science at the Russia Institute at King's College London. Um, Gulnaz pursues research on issues of post-communist political economy, authoritarianism, and social psychology with a specific focus on Russia. She's the author of The Red Mirror, Putin's Leadership and Russia's Insecure Identity, uh, 2020, and Political Consequences of Crony Capitalism Inside Russia, 
2010. Uh, she's currently working on a new book, The Afterlife of the Soviet Man, Rethinking Homo Sovieticus. I just want to remind everybody before Gulna starts that you should feel free to use the Q&A to write down questions uh, as, the, as our panelists are speaking, uh, if you like, so that they're ready to go when we get to the question part of the program. So Gulna, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. David, thank you for a very systematic um, uh, presentation there. I think it really laid out in a really nice puzzle. And um, uh, I have a lot of anecdotal things to, to, to support uh, some of your points with, but maybe we'll come to them uh, in the Q&A period. In my um, bit of presentation, I wanted to focus briefly on two things. One is the territorial pattern of voting of electoral results in Russia, whether they have changed and you know, just taking into account diverse uh, practices and diverse outcomes that we have observed over the past many years of voting in Russia. And I wanted to go a little bit um, have, you know, ha coming uh, later in the presentation and with all the context laid out, I wanted to bring a bit more attention into the debates around the electronic voting results in Moscow and uh, what uh, type of fraud uh, might have been, uh, might have occurred there and um, uh, trying to put it uh, also with some predictions or expectations for, for the future uh, of Russian voting system and electoral processes. So uh, to give a very brief answer to the territorial uh, patterns, uh, I, uh, from my perspective, I didn't see any big shifts in terms of how uh, Russia's diverse regional um, structure worked uh, to produce electoral results. And uh, the outcomes were pretty expected in terms of uh, the ethnic republics uh, in the North Caucasus, but also joined by Tatarstan, Bashkortostan, and places like Kemerova, but also Tuva, producing very high, disproportionately high results for United Russia through the administrative control that uh, the governors have and that have practiced over many, many rounds of these elections. So we have about eight, nine regions where United Russia won with over 70 and sometimes over 80% uh, of votes, um, you know, uh, with a very quick um, uh, point about executive uh, elections, regional executive elections that were held as well, the outrageous result of uh, Kadyrov's presidential election was 99.2 uh, or something, so very close to 100%. So that's one uh, um, sort of um, edge uh, that is quite um, uh, conspicuous there. Uh, uh, on the other hand, um, we do also have regions where uh, voting results have been much more regular and close to what the real uh, public opinion uh, uh, has revealed. And those regions are usually um, those in the uh, northwest of Russia, places like Karelia, Pskov, Novgorod, Arhangelsk, but also places like um, uh, Tomsk, um, uh, Irkutsk, uh, in, uh, in the Far East. And um, I think it was already noted by one of the observers that as the results uh, came in during the day of elections and on the 19th specifically, uh, you know, we saw uh, results coming from the Far East being quite shocking to the United Russia because um, region after region from Primorye, Kamchatka, uh, Khabarovsk, um, communists were winning over the United Russia. And that's again something regularly happens, but still, it every time when we're when we're looking over the process occurring in uh, real time, it does raise question and, and concerns. I'm, I'm sure from the administrative perspective from the Kremlin, but um, uh, and on the federal party lists in Saha in um, in Habarovsk, a communist half won. Although uh, in the single member districts, uh, majority uh, United Russia candidates have won. So uh, that's, uh, that's about the, the patterns and what we see in terms of the very diverse results and where, um, where most uh, fraudulent irregular results occur. This is not to say that, you know, as David pointed out, the types of fraud and the types of practices that um, occur in different regions uh, differ and they range from ballot staffing, you know, uh, to pre-electoral tricks of removing candidates and um, uh, controlling who runs, making arrangements for who will win, making inter-party arrangements, which is very regular uh, as well. Um, 
Let me move now to the Moscow electronic voting uh, fraud investigation. And the big uh, questions, they emerged already at the time when uh, the data was not revealed um, uh, quickly. I think uh, Vinny Diktov, um, the head of the observation uh, task force, uh, they uh, reported it around 2 a.m. or so. So it took um, many hours of um, uh, hidden data uh, from the electronic voting. And um, at this point, uh, the official um, uh, authority, you know, the authorities are claiming that they um, gone through four times of recount. And, um, you know, a group of um, programmists and technically advanced um, <laughs> scientists are, you know, trying to, who have downloaded the data from uh, electronic voting uh, systems are trying to unpack the patterns in the data to understand potentially if fraud happened then why it might have been. The official um, explanation for the overturning of all those districts that were being won by uh, smart uh, voting candidates by the party of power candidates was that the loyalists were pressured into the electronic voting to a much greater extent, while the opposition really uh, asked its supporters to vote uh, offline, to come and vote uh, with paper ballots. So th there might have been a selection bias and that's the official explanation for why uh, these results shifted in such a blatant manner. Uh, many of you saw those two maps with uh, Moscow districts that turn from mostly green to mostly um, blue with the blue representing the vote for the United Russia candidates and with the green uh, being the candidates from the smart, uh, smart voting uh, lists. Now, um, a group that coalesced around Anastasia Bryukhanova, one of the candidates from Yablaka in District 198, has been doing a lot of investigative work. And let me just report that um, what type of you know, number irregularities or pattern irregularities they have noticed. So, um, you know, the, don't ask me to go into entirely the technique of blockchains, but to my understanding, the blockchains consist of blocks of 100, um, uh, can, you know, 100 voters. And because of the spread of the information through different servers, uh, no changes could occur without a visible uh, confirmation of these changes. And uh, most electronic votes in these blocks of candidates uh, have occurred with the turnout of 95%. So that those uh, who signed up for electronic voting, 95% actually turned up and voted, which is much higher than usually you have in the, but it's also easier, right? So that's explained. But they found in 10 blocks of 100, 1,000 electronic voters uh, who turned up at one point in time with only 80% of turnout. So they show it in graphs this unusual irregularity saying that if everywhere is 95% with all other uh, millions, uh, you know, um, hundreds, thousands of votes is 95%, um, uh, how could it be that you have this irregular number? Uh, they also noted the pattern, the uneven pattern of uh, the process of voting where there is um, sort of a gradual and slow phase. And then there is this you know, several hours of very intense voting that happens. And um, they try to, you know, basically the hypothesis there is that ballot staffing type activity could occur through electronic voting as well, because that intense period could not be explained by other things, but the, you know, potentially artificial, I don't know, bots or uh, someone hired to do that, but doing the, the voting. Uh, how, ex and, and the third pattern that uh, was brought into attention is that there was a very close correlation between ups and downs of the, uh, um, of voting for the United Russia and for the candidates from smart uh, uh, smart voting uh, list that it didn't that the shifts and changes between electronic voting and uh, normal voting did not concern all other parties but these two types of candidates so 
that was proposed that there is a high likelihood that you know either the votes that were given to the um, a smart vote candidate were shifted uh, to the United Russia candidates or some uh, way of you know uh, counting double counting the votes for United Russia might have occurred. And then the last point about this electronic voting, the last irregularity that is pointing, being pointed out very um, actively is this idea of re-voting that somehow among those 2 million um, voters, electronic voters, uh, around 300,000 or so decided to change their vote. And the thing is that within the system that is normally publicly monitored or open for public monitoring, that particular part for uh, a lot of, of, of uh, voters who have shifted, who have changed their voice, that was supposedly giving them as an opportunity to withstand administrative pressure. That particular uh, block of votes is, is in a very different system, not publicly available through this uh, blockchain system that is um, praised as something that could be controlled and monitored, but in a system that outside that is not monitored. And as observers point out, uh, the fact that executive powers and the Department of Information Technologies controls these processes, these systems, these mechanisms really sort of creates conflicts of interest and is not legitimate to start with. Now, to, uh, if I have one or two more minutes, let me just put this into the perspective of um, uh, what, what, what it holds for the future. And um, I think I'm going to build a little bit on David's point about um, specifically um, a bold action uh, by the government. Um, but I think as Josh, I might have misinterpreted what you mean by bold action. If you mean that this is investments, huge investments into modernization and infrastructural projects, whether construction related or city building related or informational technologies related, then absolutely, that seems to be a big choice. It doesn't mean any you know, innovatively principled new economic policies that, that, you know, that would open up, you know, that, that, that means something for institutions. It's really putting a lot of money into infrastructure and, you know, this modernization. Now, Moscow and Sabanian, I mean, this is his really uh, a strong point, and this has been his big um, thing, I guess, his policy thing that, the, that he has been investing a lot into both infrastructure and into the information technologies and um, has used it politically to, to gain support from Moscovites. And, uh, you know, from the very recent response by Putin, who, you know, praised the results of electronic voting and suggested that those who criticize electronic voting usually tend to be those who lost thereby explaining the, their concerns or really shifting them away. Uh, but his official sort of confirmation does appear as a, this signal that this, this was a good testing ground, that this was a good experiment that worked really well to hide you know, how fraud could occur even in such uh, you know, educationally uh, prosperous, educationally advanced place as Moscow, that this would be um, really uh, projected to other regions and other places. And um, as far as I'm concerned, I do expect, I mean, we, there is a political pushback and Litvinovich and the political coalition to lobby against electronic voting and all these debates that is ongoing right now, um, against electronic voting to delegitimize it go, is going against it. But I think for the authorities, this is one big learning curve that, um, that they will try to, um, uh, to, to project to the rest of Russia as well. And I think Putin signaled that. So I'm going to stop at this point uh, to leave more time for Q&A. Wonderful, thank you so much, Gulnaz. Very much appreciated. And our final uh, discussant, we're now going to, our panelists, we're now going to move uh, from the subject of the election results themselves into the question of protest. And we're delighted to have Regina Smith here to uh, guide us on this part of the discussion, who is a professor of political science at Indiana University. Um, and her primary research interest is in the dynamics of state society relations in transitional electoral authoritarian regimes. She's written extensively on political development in the Russian found and the Russian Federation, including her recent books, Elections, Protest, and Authoritarian Regime Stability, 
Russia 2008 to 2020, published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. So no one better who could be talking to us about protest in Russia. Her research largely based on, or lack thereof, <laughs> to explain the lack thereof of the protest. Um, her, re her research largely based on original data collection and analysis has been funded by the National Science Foundation, by the International Research and Exchanges Board, the US-Russia Foundation, National Council for Eurasian and East European Research, the National Security Education Program, Smith Richardson, and the Russian and East European Center, uh, Ostrom Workshop at Department of Political Science and Colleges of Arts and Sciences at Indiana University. Regina, we're delighted to have you here to tackle this important piece of the question or lack thereof. So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for having me. And I want to give a little plug about how nice it is to be on a panel with uh, Jake and Felix, who are so brilliantly bringing substance to Twitter. So if you don't follow them, I really recommend that you start. I want to start by talking, uh, echoing Felix, that the outcome of this election, both regime strategy and societal response, were decided well before the campaign period started. So that um, it's unlikely that either the level of fraud, the nature of fraud surprised many Russians who become used to the regime announcing an outcome and then manufacturing that outcome. And so the election provided little new information for voters, no disruption of their everyday lives. And nonetheless, I would argue that it did introduce some uncertainty into the political system going forward, which makes uh, change harder to predict. Oh, and, and this is not to uh, counter David or Glunaz. Certainly the control over elections is firm, but it's almost like squeezing a water balloon at, that's bulging at a different place. So in my work, I see the battle between the Kremlin and the opposition, not as just during this election period, but as a permanent campaign. And the action between these elections that help shape the context is the most important. And uh, Jake talked a little bit about this, the importance of Moscow in 2019 and what each side learned from that. Uh, the contestation in the regions led by KPRF around pension reform and other events that are well known to most of us thinking about it. And I think sometimes when we talk about Navalny, um, we often miss that the genius of the team is that during this period, they linked elections and protests to increase the transfer of resources and to create demonstration projects that increased potentially the efficacy of electoral competition. And so that these ongoing protest events that I talked about were really increasing the transfer of resources between elections and protests in terms of activists, organization, communication, mobilization frames. And this was happening at the local and regional levels and helping to link local grassroots movements to broader political movements that went beyond Moscow and Peter. And I think that we ignore this to our peril. And I think the second important thing is where there were election electoral breakthroughs in Tomsk and Khabarovsk in Moscow, you saw at least a perception of better governance. So that there was an idea that there were there was collaboration possible to solve problems and get things done. So the goal in this inter-election period was how to stop this transfer of resources and engagement in protest, to decouple elections and protest by cutting off resources. And here, you know, we see the foreign agent law that we haven't talked so much about yet. Jake noted the importance of eliminating competition. David talked about it as well. I think we can't underestimate the importance of the curation of ballots in order to create UR victories without a lot of visible manipulation. And also the more subtle manipulation of the media ecology and information available to voters. And uh, our colleague, Jeremy, Jeremy Morris has pointed out that even without big tech, Russians communicate very well amongst themselves, but UR is also doing things like between elections, uh, shaping the media ecology at the very local level to shape those discussions that people are having amongst each other. 
I want to say just a little bit about the changing nature of repression. So obviously the stakes are higher with foreign agent laws. They're being deployed more aggressively against non-political targets, against speech, against donations, and other previously tolerated act. Um, but I think the added element here is that the pattern is it engages close circles and others in the lives of these people, both as informers and as restraints on participation. So that you're starting to see this new pattern of the police visiting protesters at night. You saw it even with communist participants in the very, very tepid Pushkin Square rally that was held in Moscow. And this sort of individual level contacting is new and it changes the dynamic of repression. David mentioned economic repression. And I think we can't, we can't overstate this, that the message of stability is no longer a macroeconomic quality of life ensured by Putin, but an individual construct in which keeping your job in a bad economy is a central motivation. And nonetheless, despite the importance of that, we see non-compliance with voting among some of those who were compelled to vote. But it is true that the election was managed to short circuit the probability of protest. And there is some real sense that the team was effective in managing the presidential administration team was very effective. Data that Golis presented on discussion and interest in elections in the regions suggests that the interest in elections peaked at the point of candidate entry, that is six weeks before the vote, and then fell rapidly and didn't recover in the very tepid campaign. It's also important to recognize that the data show and my work uh, on previous protest events shows that not every citizen who observes fraud blames the regime. So it's true that Putin supporters may not recognize fraud, but even those who recognize fraud may attribute that to lower level bureaucrats or individual bad apples. Um, and certainly the circus of fraud that we saw on election day, the invisible ink, the voting flag, women trying to build or urns around votes that keeps spilling out, suggest a very incoherent local response that could bolster that idea that, that fraud is a regional problem, not a national mandate. So I want to just turn a little shortly to the dynamics of mobilization and why this election didn't encompass the dynamics we usually see that bring out big crowds. Um, the first idea is that in 2011, 2012, my study and other people show that the largest majority of protesters were mobilized by the protests themselves, and that a vanguard of the leadership, the online activists, and young people who went to the streets out in front and demonstrated the value of participation was extraordinarily important for shaping 2011, 12. And in 2021, the vanguard is in jail, in exile, or under threat, and we've talked about that. The likely vanguard from the 2021 Navalny protests are also under threat and subject to pressure to not participate from parents, grandparents, school, and university officials, and other political actors. And this doesn't entirely explain why with lots of fraud, we don't see protest in Moscow, but certainly a lot of the most aggrieved uh, candidates who suffered under this manipulation of electronic voting are not forging a protest vanguard. They're taking actions like Gulnas just talked about. Moreover, many studies of post-election protests show that the vanguard is shaped by engagement in the electoral process. And this is why the processes of disengagement, letting go of turnout, decreasing interest, running a tepid campaign, and, and really marginalizing any sort of exciting opposition was so important. It decreased the number of people who were mobilizable, that first step towards mobilization. The people who might have seen others on the streets and said, my vote was stolen too, and I'm going to go out and join them. So in this sense, the, the popular disengagement 
And I'd be careful about apathy because I often think that apathy is a more permanent state where disengagement is a response to context. Forced uh, the regime to accept turnout decline, which has been an important abrogation of the goal. Um, I could talk a little bit about smart, smart vote, but I wanna just make the point that smart vote is really two things. Um, in districts where there is choice, as there was in Moscow and, and some other districts, then, then the opportunity to strategically coordinate around those candidates can be really powerful in engaging people. And that does appear to have happened at least partly in Moscow. In other places, it's merely a vehicle to express protest, but it's not a strongly um, uh, costly act. And it's not one that engaged, that really um, demands a lot of engagement. So therefore, it's not the kind of pre-engagement that we might expect to, to form this mobilizable core. Let me just uh, talk about a couple of other effects that were really important in 2011-12 that aren't important, that, that seem to be at play now. In every focus group I've done, whether it's about Moscow housing renovation project or about protest and engagement, the people in the group say, at least a plurality says, why protest? It just makes the regime angry and increases repression. There are other ways to participate. Do that and don't make it worse for everyone. And this seems to be the lesson of 2021. The second message is, we know the state does what it wants to do and resisting is futile. And this is a message that's getting stronger and stronger. The third aspect is Belarus. So what happened in Belarus reinforces both the views I just uh, articulated, but it also raises another important issue, which is now Russia is looking like Belarus. And anecdotally and in polling data, we see that Russians take some pride, and as David mentioned, don't like to think of themselves as a country in which election fraud is normalized. And it's increasingly unavoidable that with the comparison of repressive dictators that Russia is looking like Belarus. So where does this leave the system? I think we're seeing a growing frustration and angry constituency and a growing representation gap. And while this doesn't raise, doesn't mean that there's a likelihood of breakthrough in elections and protest is very difficult to participate, uh, to uh, predict, but I do think it raises the likelihood of renewed grassroots events in the regions, so that some of this will do, will happen as it did in 2011-12, where activism goes back into the regions, where shocks and policies disrupt everyday life, citizens' life, and there is renewed potential for collective action through coordination, like we saw around the trash incinerator protests that led to such, that led to linkage across the country and created a bigger challenge. So uh, standing on the soldiers of giants, I'll stop there and go to Q&A. Great, thanks so much, Regina. I'm gonna to toss it over to Alex for the first question. Yeah, thanks so much everyone for those really sharp and insightful presentations. Already I would say uh, we've learned a lot of really interesting contemporary things from what some described as sort of a routine election. I wanna pick up on a point that's made by Sophia Jordan in uh, the chat, who talks about um, the role of Google and Apple um, and their role, of course, in taking down the smart voting app. Um, since we've had a number of articles in the US media talking about, you know, does this signal, you know, the the final complicity of big tech with authoritarian governments, what are gonna be the ramifications if Russia does it to every other authoritarian government there? And just pick up on David's point about sort of technologies. One other thing the Russian government did was to pass a law that insisted that tech firms have an on the ground presence. Uh, and in fact, it seems as if they leveraged that um, to intimidate and harass these tech companies. So I'd be curious and, and we'll go in panel order, whoever wants to pick this up, you know, what has been 
um, you know, the reaction to this big tech capitulation, was this something that was coming all the time and it was just a matter of timing? Or um, was there actually something that pushed them over the edge in terms of what was threatened or, or dangled in, in front of them? Be really curious to get the panel's take on that. Uh, I can just offer a few quick words then. Yeah, um, please, Jake. So, yeah. so the, the in terms of the reaction, um, the reaction from in Russia, from Navalny's camp was absolute fury uh, at, at what happened. They couldn't believe it. They especially couldn't believe if we bring Telegram into this mix, who, which is the biggest app obviously used in Russia for messaging, who voluntarily kicked off their bot without any pressure from the Russian uh, government because they wanted to copy Apple and Google. So I think it's hard to underestimate how much anger there is at the tech companies here in Russia. Um, and then what I would add in terms of whether this was inevitable, I, well, I think part of the reason there's been such a furious reaction is because people don't think it was inevitable. Because if you look at how Apple and Google have responded even just six, seven months ago, when uh, Roskomnadzor was sending them content deletion requests every day, take down this video, calling people to protest, they were basically kicking it along the grass. They'd take down one or two, leave the rest up, and they wouldn't do anything about it. You know, they, 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 take, they take their time paying fines or don't pay them. So this was incredible in terms of the Kremlin really was able to have, this is the first big success they've had in coercing Apple and Google into follow these, these requirements, which people thought was very unlikely to happen. Great. Uh, Felix, do you have anything to add? Felix, we can't hear you. Yep, you're on mute. Sorry guys, sorry, I do apologize, sorry. Um, yeah, so look, I think I would, you know, Jake spoke to sort of the reaction among the Navalny sort of camp. I think that um, my anecdotal sense was that in sort of general, in terms of sort of general society, I think the reaction to sort of these two kind of, you know, US tech giants, and, and indeed a sort of a, a semi-Russian one in, in terms of Pavel Durov's uh, telegram, uh, acting on this sort of, this spur from the authorities, was quite muted, just in the sense that I think those recommendations, the smart voting recommendations were always out there. And if you wanted them, you could get them. The removals didn't stop that. They were still there to be found. You could go on Wikipedia. They were there, for instance. You know, they were there and they were just sort of in the public consciousness, I think. And, and to be honest, I think as well, um, people were able to make up their minds, uh, you know, based on other factors in the smart vote, right? You know, the smart vote kind of, to some extent, piggybacks on who's who looks like they could win, right? So if you see like a candidacy that's that's got a lot of physical presence in your given district, then you might rally behind them themselves. So I think I wouldn't. I, I it was definitely a huge sort of blow to the Navalny people, but I think it wasn't. It didn't necessarily prevent the smart vote from working which i think it you know in, in many ways in in some ways as i said before i think it did work especially in moscow uh so you know i think there's some room for nuance there perhaps yeah thanks for that felix uh david any further thoughts on big tech you mentioned yeah it. i think i mean really what happens next is whether or not this is going to be the rohingya moment for google and apple because after that happened u.s regulators started to get involved with what facebook was doing abroad and really put scrutiny on them and called it in front of in front of Congress people to explain their actions. And if the US decides to do the same thing here, which it could, you could see Congress people jump on this issue and say at Google and Apple, how explain yourself and, and talk about how you're going to prevent this from going forward. And if the US government can prevent this from happening, then potentially it's going to change the ballgame. But it really depends on, on what our regulators do to big tech that'll shape as much what big tech does in Russia as much as what the Russian government is going to be threatening to do in big tech. So the ball, I think, now is not in Russia's court. It's in the U.S.'s court to see how they're going to handle this. That's a great point. Uh, Goldas, do you have any any Just a quick point that um, at least Pavel Durov explained his action by referring to the Russian law um, uh, limiting the um, agitation, the campaigning during uh, one day before before the election. And I wonder, I mean, it is a formal pretext, but it could be linked up to the fact that smart, smart voting list is 
a list that contains, you know, um, a, uh, an advocacy of specific candidates. And that's, that's what was used. And I cannot see how big tech can, you know, in all their minds go and say we, we're going to be uh, illegal in the country. So if they are called for legality, they have to follow the law. So that could come as one very quick uh, explanation, at least from Durov's perspective, I am not as familiar with the type of threats that Google and Apple were given. Thank you. Uh, Regina, do you have thoughts? Yeah, just a short, very brief thought, which is that there's a lot of cognitive dissonance happening after this election. And one point of cognitive dissonance, I think, is that in Russia, there was massive outrage about Trump being silenced on social media and no outrage here. And so to the extent that we're seeing these sort of cognitive pressures build on Russian citizens, I think there's this subtle action that's happening where the state is flip-flopping and uh, a lot of, um, uh, opinion leaders are flip-flopping. Oh, super. Thanks to you all. Uh, Josh has the next question. Yeah, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I want to stick, uh, take this topic just in a slightly different direction, which is to take the question from Jennifer Long about the future for smart voting. So on the one hand, there's now this sort of threat with the, with the Apple and Google being coward. And so we'll bracket that for a second. And, and, and given that you all have just addressed answers to this, but as a technique, Right. Is this the future of elections under Putin that like this is here to stay? It's proved that it it has it proved that it could work. It, it looked like it had proved that it could work on previous election here. It proved that it could be a coordination device, but the results weren't really changed. Uh, and also just curious um, whether we think this is something that's going to spread outside of Russia now that we've had a couple of elections and we have a piece of technology to sort of go alongside of it. Is this something that's going to become we're going to look back on this and as as becoming a sort of growing phenomenon internationally? Should I go first again? Same order? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. So I would, a few things on smart voting, I think. Um, one thing as well to highlight is that smart voting in many respects is actually driving divisions among the opposition in Russia. And, and Felix and I wrote some articles about this in that in many of the fields in Moscow, the whole play for an opposition candidate was get the smart voting recommendation. Right. That was like, that was the victory, you know, you had to overcome. So I think we can't underestimate the fact that this is also in terms of a legitimacy question, how are these people making decisions about districts? What data are they using? What information? How are they picking candidates? And we've already seen some attention onto that. We might see more. Um, as to the future and stuff, I'll, I'll hand over to Felix, who I know has kind of done a bit more on, on, on the effectiveness and things like that. Yeah, so uh, I, I think, yeah, I, I think what Jake said is incredibly valid, right? Like, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the viciousness of the sort of infighting to, to sort of be the candidate who got smart votes uh, in those kind of two weeks before the election was actually quite extraordinary. And, and as I sort of mentioned before, I think it did it did work. You know, there was a consistent pattern of like, you, you know, in a lot of seats, you had two candidates who were contending for the smart vote. They were roughly perhaps even, you know, given the data points, the sort of the dodgy polling, the physical presence that we had. Uh, and then the smart vote dropped and just one candidate soars upwards on the, in the final count to sort of challenge the United Russia figure. And the other is just absolutely nowhere. You know, we see that in sort of seat after seat in Moscow. And that's part of the reason why I think in sort of in, in, you know, in, in Moscow, at least and in Russia in the future, I think there is a future for, for smart voting because a mythology has sort of already emerged that smart voting would have won had they not sort of, uh, you know, dumped all these un uh, unauditable uh, online votes on at the end. Uh, I think more broadly, uh, it, it's difficult to say, but I think there are at least enough results because I mean, I think something like 15 smart voting backed candidates won. Now, some of them were also backed by the authorities. Uh, this is Russia wide, I mean. Um, so I think that's enough of a sort of a substantive change in the sort of makeup of the Duma that it will give uh, impetus to continue with the project. The question, however, is that, um, well, the question as I see it is that it's not as though like Leonid Volkov or any of the other guys in the sort of the remnants of the Navalny camp are well liked among the opposition sort of uh, rank and file. You know, the, the Russian opposition is a sort of a, a, a horrendously sort of complex tangle of, of, of mutually despising sort of groupuscules, you know, uh, and, and I don't think the, the Volkov camp or the people in sort of Vilnius or wherever they are who write the smart voting sort of lists uh, are above that. And I think, you know, the, 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 their, their organization has been in the last few months dismantled to such an extent uh, 
that I wonder when the next sort of electoral challenge comes around, will they be in a position to enjoy it, to sort of enjoy this kind of weird legitimacy that they had? Because, you know, something, another sort of anecdotal impression I had from the election campaign was that candidates who, you know, would say that Navalny is, is, is a populist, he's a fascist, he's a nationalist, whatever, would say, but obviously I want smart voting because, you know, it's obviously a huge electoral asset that I want, that I want, I want to get. Um, and I wonder how long, how much longer that will will endure, especially because I don't think Navalny is going to be free anytime soon. Uh, I don't think Leonid Volkov is going to be able to return to Russia anytime soon. So I'd be very, very curious to see how those kind of practical factors play out in the future. Anyway, David, real quick, I think there's I have two two things to say. Um, first is that. Smart voting met its match with electronic voting. And if electronic voting goes nationwide in a couple of years, it's unclear whether or not smart voting is gonna be effective. So I, I think it had its advantage, but now the regime kind of knows how to counter it. Now electronic voting could also be undermined too. The second thing is that smart voting is really funny from a political science perspective, because it's a closed primary where just a small group of unaccountable elites decide who they want to support. And that's great when you said the opposition is really uncoordinated and hates each other. And then you just have these like 10 people writing a list about who everybody should do. But is that an exportable system? Like that parties exist for that. Parties have open primaries, parties evaluate and group people and ideologize. Like it's not necessarily a sustainable tool, but it is short-term strategic, tactical. If, you, if the regime doesn't see it coming, you can surprise them, but it's not democratic in any sense. That doesn't mean it's not helpful to push for an overall democratic force, but it's not a democratic decision-making. And I think that might limit its attractiveness in other contexts, but I don't know. It, it's just, it's got this funny character to it. In a weird way, it's kind of similar to <clears throat> uh, Trump and the Republican primaries, yep. right? You've got all these candidates who are, you know, contested, want to get Trump's endorsement in the Republican primary. And once you get it, you zoom up ahead of everybody. Right. So in a weird way. So on the one hand, yes, it's not a very like it's a closed primary with very few people involved. And it, in, in, a, in a flip side, that's exactly what we normally call endorsements. Right. Like it's an it's an endorsement, which we used to think of as a very democratic thing when you got endorsements from the newspaper and things like that. And they mattered and people have bemoaned the lack of lack of endorsements. Um, we do have, all right, Alex, I'll pass back to you. We're getting short on time. There, there are more great questions here. I know I want to hear a little bit about 2024 before we go, but Alex, what do you want to go with the next question? Yeah, let me uh, pick up on Brian Taylor's question. Brian, thanks for joining us. Um, <laughs> and he is uh, talking about, picking up on uh, David and uh, Gulnaz's points on bold policy moves and pointing out uh, Putin has traditionally been very fiscally conservative. Do you think that will change? Where will the money come from? for big infrastructure investments. And bear in mind, it's one of the most corrupt sectors anywhere. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, Gulnaz, do you wanna pick up on this and especially the potential sort of targeting of infrastructure? Yes, so where the money will come from, from the same place it has been coming from over the last years, right? The tax collection has improved the prices for oil and now we see gas is you know going really going up so even in the absence of um economic growth uh, there will be coming into the budget and there will need to be decisions made and if i understand correctly the military budget has been a bit decreased but the infrastructural projects is a good way to capture the public attention with this idea of modernizing life and improving life for citizens uh, so uh, plus i agreed uh, brian with your point that these infrastructural projects have been notorious for rent seeking and for rent distribution so in a way, this might be one mechanism that gives both ways to elites interested in rent distribution and rent seeking and to the public as a visible proof that authorities are doing something uh, uh, to, you know, in their interest. And we have seen this work in Moscow. We have seen this work really well in Tatarstan. And uh, certainly it will be attempted to be transferred. And it is now in the process of, you know, uh, of being projected to other regions as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, Josh? 
So we got a question about uh, we got a question about 2024 and what we what where this leaves us heading into 2024. And I read a piece. I think it was in the Washington Post. I, I was furiously trying to refine it so I could get the author's name. But basically saying, you know, th this narrative that's emerging that is across lots of coverage, media coverage you see of it, is that this election, despite all the careful management of it, you know, reveals this sort of fundamental weakness to the system, right? That you have United Russia, which is sort of burned out on its support. They have to be more and more manipulation in order to get the election taken forward. And that what's, what, what this is doing is it's masking rising discontent, discontent in the country, or it is, or it's showing it, but it's not, a, you know, I think back to Samuel Huntington, right? If you don't let people affect themselves and, the, you know, show their displeasure at the ballot booth, eventually they come out onto the streets. We've heard all the reasons why people haven't come out on the streets here. But the art, one of the arguments I saw is that like, okay, so everyone's taking a pause here. We're not going to see big protests after the Duma elections because it's the Duma elections, but this is really setting up for potential trouble ahead of 2024, Right. Do we think that this is is the takeaway here? I mean, if I had to push you all to choose between the takeaway is sort of David's world of, wow, they're really good at this. <laughs> like they are getting better and better. They're not resting on past laurels. They have found online voting as a way to do electoral fraud in an easy, even easier way than previously. And so on one end, it's like, yeah, 2024 is coming up and we shouldn't expect any, you know, any challenge problem for this regime versus the look, they had to pull out all the stops to get this really unpopular United Russia party elected. People are, you know, there's a great deal of dissatisfaction, even with all the power of this regime. The party of power can only get 30 percent support in the polls. And when push comes to shove and when things really matter in 2024, the regime has this huge question about whether Putin runs again. And if not, who's his successor? So I guess the last thing I'd like to do, just because I have all of you here, is I'd love to hear sort of where you where you fit on this uh, on this spectrum and what you think, if anything, what we've learned in the last week means heading into Russia's, and I don't want to see an even medium term future. I mean, the, the future of this regime as we as we head into 2024. So that's my that's my closing question. Should we start with Regina? Yeah, let's go. We'll go reverse order this time. Regina. So so let me say just yeah. Um, smart voting is very contextual and it's unlikely to work in a presidential election because the ballot will be very, very tightly controlled. There'll be only one credible candidate on that ballot and coordinating around uh, the people who will be on the ballot will be very, very risky. And I think Russians will see it as risky. Um, but I still think that A, it's not clear that Putin will run because if Putin runs, he needs uh, this kind of legitimacy kind of victory. And the legitimacy victory, the high turnout, high payoff victory, I think we've just learned is gonna be extraordinarily costly. And so I think that's part of the uncertainty that we're looking at going into 2024. Thanks, Golaz? Just a quick, Prediction. I never make predictions, but I want to make this one. Um, you know, given the potential of electronic voting and the potential, it allows for other candidates to win easily, but it might not be taken by the society uh, in terms of fraud, but it will be taken by the society in terms of if Putin runs. So uh, the combination of the two might work. So my prediction would be that there will be an expansion of electronic voting, but it will also pressure, it will not allow the regime to go with any other candidate unless they will prepare that candidate early on with the support basis being built up before. So no black horses unless they will, they will be prepared. David? Uh, for me, this new regime is in year one from the poisoning of Navalny. So the last regime is about 20 years old. I think this next regime will be less than 20 years, but it's still in year one. And the likely scenario is like Belarus last year, but we're years away from that. So I think it's got a, the half-life is, is still far ahead. And that I don't, I don't think the regime is that concerned with 2024. I think it's, it, it still has to go through this next development trajectory of which it really just began. Yeah, I, I, Felix, I'd, yeah, I'd probably uh, echo David in the sense that I think that uh, look in 2024, um, 
they will be except whether Putin runs or not, they will be exceptionally careful uh, in betting whoever is allowed to run. They'll not have a Grudinian part two like last time when the communist candidate proved too uncomfortably popular. Uh, they will likely choose an extreme, foist an extremely unpopular and unappealing candidate on the communists in particular because they seem to be emerging as the sort of the locus of opposition now. In the longer term, though, I think that um, a problem is emerging because I think that 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 it is clearly becoming harder and harder to sort of mobilize people in support of Putin and in support of United Russia. And they're not going anywhere. They're not graduating towards Navalny. Not really, really graduating to the communists either. But this sort of large, uh, disinterested, sort of uh, indifferent mass is expanding. And it reminds me somewhat of sort of Belarus before last, the events of last year. I think people had sort of drifted away from their sort of traditional political loyalties there, but they hadn't gained any new ones. And that seems to be what's happening now. I think probably if something happens in the next 10 years, it will be some kind of entirely unpredictable black swan event that, that people suddenly mobilize around, much as, as Svetlana Tikhonovskaya was there. But of course, the Belarus example is that there's no absolutely no guarantee that that will have any sort of long-term consequence or be successful in itself. So I, uh, it's a team David, basically, is, is, is my loyalty right now. Jake? Yeah, I would, I would join that team as well. Um, I, I would probably just highlight as well that Putin isn't United Russia. Part of United Russia's function is to take away some of this, you know, this uh, discontent towards the party and the parliament rather than the president uh, himself. Um, and, and yeah, in terms of smart voting, uh, it, it's, you know, Based on what's happened, almost certainly it would rec it would recommend the communist candidate, and that means that the Kremlin knows that they're not going to put forward any kind of communist candidate that stands any chance of actually beating Putin or is in any way popular. And so, um, I I don't really think they're they're worried about 2024 at this stage. Great. Well, thank you to you all. Um, we are at time, so thank you, Jake. Thank you, Felix. Thank you, David. Thank you, Gulnaz. Thank you, Regina. Uh, thank you. Uh, to the audience for joining us and for your great questions. Sorry, we didn't quite get a chance to answer them all. Just a reminder, our next RPP um, will happen next month on October 25th. The topic will be Russia and Afghanistan. Um, and so I hope you will all join us back then. But on behalf of uh, Josh and myself, uh, thanks again to everyone um, at the Harriman Institute and at NYU behind the scenes who make these events happen. Um, especially to Carly and Sasha. Have a wonderful uh, rest of day and we will see you soon. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you everyone, goodbye. Thanks, thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.